Welcome to Civil Discourse, a podcast where participants are free to share their ideas, empathize with other perspectives, and who intend to advance to a better solution to fix a societal ill. We will focus on topics that are particularly complicated. In a time where information is from sources more opinionated than ever, our mission is to find solutions and goals to accelerate the nation's progress with cultural impunity. I'm your host, Todd Furness. Thank you and welcome to today's podcast. I'm really elated. I've been looking forward to this so much you can't even you can't even know about having uh, Senator Steve Daines on the podcast today to talk about something I think is really important, uh, the Competitive Health Insurance Reform Act that he sponsored. And just before we get to that, I want to just remind everybody, if you like these videos, please like, share, and and uh, subscribe. We love your support and we are grateful for it. And I think these are important conversations. Senator Daines, thank you so much for coming. I am so excited about this. I, you know, I'm a wonky guy. I love talking about healthcare and I love what you've done with Kyra. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, glad to be with you, Todd. So I, you know, when I started thinking about today, the first thing that came into my mind was uh, the scene from Casablanca, you know, of all the gin joints, uh, of all the legislation, you could have tackled, why on earth would you have tackled uh, health care insurance? What were you seeing in the marketplace that really gave you concern? Well, uh, Todd, as you know, I spent 28 years in the, in the private sector before coming to, uh, to Capitol Hill. I was a chemical engineer by degree. I worked for Procter & Gamble for 13 years, uh, launching many times FDA-regulated products. Uh, and I understand the importance of competition and how, how competition drives the right kind of incentives and, and better behaviors than monopolies. And so this really uh, was the product of looking at history, of looking at uh, this uh, you know, obscure McCarran-Ferguson provision going back to 1945. And what it resulted in is uh, for, for far too long, health insurance companies have really been taking advantage of outdated antitrust exemption that goes back to this McCarran-Ferguson that's allowed them to raise premiums and deny consumers choice. Ultimately, when consumers have more choice, uh, they usually get better outcomes, better value, uh, oftentimes better pricing. And certainly when it comes to healthcare, you want to make sure in this very personal decision uh, that you you were allowed to make the best choice for your particular need. So, for those who do, who don't know, McGarren is an act that was ostensibly a state's rights idea in some way, in that it promoted the idea of not uh, insurance companies being regulated by the states and not being regulated or subject to federal antitrust law. Uh, it seems to have misfired substantially, and I, I would assert that perhaps even more magnified in its problems because of the ACA. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, collectively with McGarren and the ACA, there was considerably less consumerism at play because individuals were buying more insurance and were, it, whether it was subsidized by the government or not, it was there was increasingly less price sensitivity because individuals weren't paying directly. So whether right. they're paying for their insurance or, uh, directly or they're paying for the health care, Fewer people were doing that, which means that use of services increased, price also increased, the cost of the federal government increased, the cost of state governments increased. And there seemed, prior to this act passing, there seemed to be no way to bridle uh, the increasing in price that was. It continues to happen year over year. Well, Todd, it, it, as you know, somebody who's really a subject matter expert on this on this topic and, and uh, so involved in healthcare, you know, healthcare is such a it's such a personal choice, such an important choice, and and we're seeing that increasingly. You know, we we raised four children, uh, two boys and two girls. They're now through college. Two of them are married. Our third our third child's engaged. We have another grandchild in the way. We're in that season of life. But we are also in the season of life of helping aging parents. Uh, my father-in-law and mother-in-law are 88, 89 years old. My dad's 82. My mom's 79. And I think the more you dig into some of the challenges that our seniors face, it, of course, healthcare is even that much greater of a topic, you know, virtually every day. And it just comes back to this, the importance of needing greater transparency, uh, greater oversight within healthcare. 
so that truly, um, you know, our, our parents, the American people have access to and the options of affordable health care. It, it's remarkable to you think about, you know, what a significant part of the economy, certainly health care is, depending on whose numbers you see, it's you know, maybe it's close to 20 percent of our economy. Uh, it's, it's one of the few economic transactions that we make as consumers where the first question is not how much does it cost? And that's because, as you just mentioned, uh, we're, we, we've got you know, third parties in between the consumer and the provider, in the, usually the form of the insurance companies or the federal government. And when you take the, that part of the equation out for the consumer who's not asking fundamentally what's it going to cost, in, in part because nobody oftentimes knows what it's going to cost because of lack of transparency, uh, it's no wonder why we have escalating costs of health care because we've taken away choice. And that's one of the reasons we worked for years to pass this bill. It passed late last year. President Trump signed it into office on January 13th of 2021, just before he left office. And it's going to help protect consumers. It's going to help uh, insurance companies be held accountable for predatory actions. Well, I'm right there with you in terms of our stages of life. I'm a lot older than you, of course, but uh, I just had my uh, my uh, first granddaughter yesterday. And please report. And Congratulations. My, my father-in-law is 87, and he's just an absolute hero of mine who works probably 40 hours a week still. He's uh, just a, a brilliant guy and the most humble of people um, to whom I look up all the time, and he's a fantastic person. Um so the, one of the things that's happened also, and it happened almost contemporaneous with the passage of Cairo, was the Pricing Transparency Act, and another law signed uh, into another act signed into law by uh, President Trump. But what we're seeing is a great deal of pushback on the disclosure of pricing. You correctly point out that pricing transparency is critical. What we've observed, and I did a prior podcast on this with a guy named Bill Hennessy, who has a company called Pratter, is there are at least seven prices for the same service in uh, by every service provider. There's the cash price, the Medicaid price, the Medicare price, and then usually a different price for each of the four major insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United, Cigna, and Aetna. Um, what do you see on the horizon uh, for getting more clarity around insurance pricing and then having there be a correlation between insurance pricing and the best available costs out there. Because right now what happens is, you know, I've asked probably two dozen CEOs this question. I said, you know, where do you get your insurance? They say, oh, well, I get it from Blue Cross Blue Shield. I said, no, you get it from your company. Who gets it from a broker? Who gets it from Blue Cross or one of the other companies who negotiates premium prices with the State Department of Insurance? They don't even, there's no negotiation whatsoever. Um, I, I share your passion around consumerism, and my my running perhaps uh, wrong joke is I would love to give the power of the consumer back to 100 million uh, or 150 million soccer moms to go out and negotiate negotiate price. We talk about this extensively in my book, but where do you see this pricing transparency issue in as running parallel with Kyra? Yeah, well, it's part and parcel, and I and th- this gets back to. You know, why the first question that we ask in in a healthcare transaction is not what does it cost because again we are there, there's a third party in the middle of that the question is going to be what what's my deductible right. probably going to be right. uh, and and, and th- this goes back to you know one of the 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 problems of many problems with the Affordable Care Act that was passed under President Obama and that is you know, it reduced HSAs. So it, it took more of the dollars away that consumers can put into their, their health savings accounts that uh, ultimately puts more skin in the game for the consumer. Because when it's coming out of your HSA, you're going to ask the question, how much does it cost? When it's coming out of, uh, out of, that, uh, out of that third party pre-negotiated uh, pricing structure here and that complexity of, of pricing that goes on in healthcare, that's why you're not asking that question because it's, it's not out of your pocket necessarily, but your HSA is. I, I, I'm reminded. I remember when I was. I just came through a an election last fall. You know, I had a my Senate reelect. It was one of the uh, high profile races in the nation. I was running against an, our incumbent Democrat governor, Steve Bullock. It was a 210 million dollar race, Todd, in Montana. <laughs> so it became the most expensive race on a per ballot. Uh, I know. I saw some of the things it, he he it, said about it, your it, position it, on healthcare. I couldn't understand it or believe it. It's completely inconsistent yeah. with your track record. But healthcare will always be always be an important issue in, in, in every campaign going forward because sure. it, it's it's very personal, right? We all can relate to it. Uh, but it, but if you, even if you Google um, Google, you know, gallbladder, 
uh, or you Google uh, uh, append appendix, appendectomy, for example, or knee replacement, um, usually the, the search will return the technical background on what that procedure entails. But if you Google your LASIK eye surgery, LASIK immediately you put that in, it's not about the technical uh, procedure, it's, it's about the price. It'll say $599 per eye, and, and, and this surgeon has done X number of thousand cases with 99.8% uh, uh, success rate. And you ask yourself, why? Well, of course, the answer is because LASIK is not covered in most uh, health insurance policies. It comes out of your pocket. It's an HSA item or it is something literally paid directly out of, of, of the consumer's pocket. So the consumer is going in and asking the question, how much does it cost? And guess what? Those soccer moms <laughs> have driven pricing transparency because they want to know before they decide what they're going to do. They want to know the price. They want to know the outcomes. That's all the whole value proposition. So I think until, Todd, we start shifting more of this equation to empower the consumer, we're always going to be in an uphill battle here in this issue of transparency. So one of the things that I talk about in my book is expanding the utility and the functionality of the HSA to drive more cash in there, having the ability of correlating HSAs to higher deductible plans, because right yeah. now there are limitations on it. Um, increasing the amount you can contribute to your HSA. What most people don't realize is that virtually every company is in part self-insured and most companies never get to the insurance part. Uh, and so I'm a little surprised that we don't have more of an uproar about this and more, more drives for consumerism because the companies are really shouldering these costs in a very, very direct way. Frequently, it's the second or third biggest cost on their P&L. How do we get more folks uh, really engaged in the topic? Well, I, I can relate to that, Todd. Uh, after I left Procter and Gamble, I um, I was one of the early early execs in a uh, a cloud computing startup. We took the company public. We were eventually acquired by Oracle, but I had a twelve year run in the executive team with that company. And so, you know, we face as an executive team around healthcare for our employees because we wanted to attract and retain the very best talent uh, to build a great company. Every company wants that. Um, and I see that's why you're seeing increasingly more companies now are looking at incentives, more the carrot approach in terms of, of uh, healthy living, which will provide better outcomes and incentives there. Uh, and, and again, I think that always comes back to that, Todd. It's this key word called incentives. I mean, people will go where they're incentivized. Exactly. If you start incentivizing their pocketbook, they'll, they'll start modifying behaviors to perhaps reduce higher risk behaviors that, that uh, impact health. And, and move towards a healthier lifestyle, which ultimately will will have lower healthcare costs. So, one of the things that I really have admired about you, especially given your work last year on getting the COVID vaccination uh, met, made readily available, and the, the sort of presence you had about getting the, dish, the manufacturing lines up and running, and taking some risk out for uh, the companies who are developing that, I really appreciated that. And I, so little people gave you props for that. I, I've been doing it every time I can because I think it was so important and vital to getting the vaccine out so quickly. But as we look around the corner, we, uh, we start, we're starting to see uh, the current administration talking about concentration on the hospital side of equa the equation, which is their concern is we have monopoly effects taking place right now. And strangely enough, uh, the hospitals are dominated by not-for-profits. Uh, have you started looking at that yet, or are you still just focused on the insurance issues? Well, it, it, as you know, the health, healthcare has there's a lot of variables in that equation, and uh, and as we're starting to see, like with hospitals, the increasing concentration of where hospitals are buying out the other you know, doctor practices, and docs are no longer, uh, in many cases, independent businesses. They are now just uh, uh, part of, of of the hospital. They're employees of the hospital. And, and there's a uh, study that came out said over 53% of physicians now are employed by hospitals today. And, and, and so here's the problem when you have a consolidation now with physicians, when you, when you start seeing that, uh, you know, the healthcare companies, you know, are, are buying the, the, uh, the, the insurance companies, they're buying the PBMs. So they're, they're all, they're all in concert together. And so there's no sense to try to sub, try to optimize cost because now they can start to do a lot of cost shifting. And, and that's a problem, I believe, and, and only makes the process that much more opaque versus trying to drive more transparency. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's oftentimes the first thing to do is identify the problem before you start getting the solutions in place. 
But I think that consolidation, while I understand if you're a physician, uh, certainly when you think about liability protections because of, uh, uh, you know, I'm a chemical engineer, Todd, not a trial lawyer. Um, <laughs> trial, the trial lawyers typically, uh, I don't think I got a dime you know, support from trial lawyers. That's because I think they, they oftentimes are part of driving up the cost here with this certainly frivolous uh, kind of litigation. So you raised an interesting point to me, in addition to the the opacity of the problem of the pricing issues. I think there's another issue, which is to me, there's an inherent conflict of interest. Uh, We also see United Healthcare is now being a a very rapidly growing physician practice as well through Optum. And they've got over 50,000 physicians employed by by and United. And so to me, when you, you shouldn't have to ask the question, who actually am I seeing when you go to your doctor? To your point, it's a very personal decision, and you shouldn't have to has to ask the question: Am I seeing my doctor or my insurance company when I go to my visit, or am I seeing my doctor or my hospital? Because the other thing that's happening, with un, unsurprisingly, is within that construct, uh, the physician or the hospital are also control, controlling, therefore, all of the referrals uh, throughout the course of your of your care, and that also feels like a conflict of interest. What you think about on, on one hand, you know, we're all grateful for the amazing ongoing innovation and breakthroughs as it relates to healthcare uh, technology, uh, the state of the art. Uh, we'll take MRIs as an example, uh, but those are those are expensive capital investments, and obviously utilization is uh, is very important. And so, of course, you're going to be incentivized, particularly. Again, if the consumer is, is kind of out of that equation and you know the, the healthcare, the insurance company is going to pay for it, uh, the consumer's not going to push back too much and certainly says, I need to get an MRI uh, because they're not, it's not an out-of-pocket cost for that consumer. And so that, that, that is all part of the problem of driving the cost of which drives premiums up. Uh, one of the other innovative areas that we need to keep an eye on that I think we learned from COVID was what's going on with telehealth services. Uh, and we, I included a provision in, in a, this recent piece of legislation that would actually expand telehealth services during the pandemic. Well, now we need to codify that because uh, while telehealth is not the answer to every situation, it definitely is a way that uh, improves efficiency. It uh, is easier for the consumer, particularly think about seniors or think about somebody from Montana like myself, where you live a long ways away from your healthcare provider. But if you're in the city, it's a big traffic jam to get there. So either you're having to drive a long ways or you're having to sit in traffic jams a long time and telehealth can help alleviate some of that. We wanna do though is make sure that uh, uh, the reimbursement structure is in place that will incentivize reimbursement on telehealth. And that's something that we're working on to allow HSA reimbursement when you have a telehealth kind of engagement with a provider. Yeah, that's a terrific idea. Uh, the other thing that pe- I just want to make sure I've been doing a lot of work on uh, economically challenged sections of cities and specifically with regard to broadband and healthcare and mm-hmm. how those things link up. And one of the things that people fail to remember is just because you're in a city doesn't mean you, that access is necessarily proximate. In South right. and Southern Dallas, for example, it can take you all day if you have to use public transportation just to get a few miles to Parkland Hospital for your health care. And in fact, usually what happens is, or I shouldn't say usually, but very frequently, uh, they rely on church vans to get the elderly to and from their doctor's visits. And you can imagine if you have a, uh, an hourly wage job and you're not, you're paid by the hour that you work, and you, you know, if you don't have access to telehealth, then what happens is you lose your pay when you have to go to the doctor. So not only do you have to come out of pocket to pay the doctor, but you also lose the the money that you would have you would have earned from your job to do that, and frequently the visit may be six to ten minutes. So to wipe out a day for a six to ten minute visit seems to be un, uh, at the best uncharitable, but uh, just doesn't make a whole lot of walking around sense. So the codification of of telehealth reimbursement is could be very very powerful. Well, is we we had uh, because we had no choice with uh, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we expanded telehealth. We saw that uh, both in the private service, we saw that with the VA as well. Uh, and, and so we're trying to keep the full court press. Now is not the time to cut back on telehealth access as we're emerging the pandemic. It's time, in my opinion, to double down on it. We tested this concept. The feedback overwhelmingly from both providers as well as for consumers was it was a good thing. Uh, and, and again, we're not suggesting it would replace uh, uh, an in-person kind of visit with a healthcare provider. But I think the law of Pareto might apply here, the 80-20. And so this bill that I have um, with the uh, uh, Democrat Center from Nevada, Nevada would, would permanently 
uh, allow that first dollar coverage of virtual care would be allowed under high deductible health care plans. And so th- this uh, without having to meet first meeting that deductible. So we just want to we want to create incentives now for telehealth. I think that's an innovation um, that we tested and it, and it worked. So which center are you working with in out in the uh, with, Yeah, Cortez Masto, actually. Fantastic. And one of the things, another, another thing to applaud you for is the bipartisan nature, nature in which you attack these problems. One of the things that I also, you know, uh, would observe is that our biology and our chemistry don't change when we cross straight state lines. And so the telehealth issue runs up against sta- other state issues like state licensing issues, but it also breeds a great deal of competition. So there's a great opportunity there for us to really reduce cost and price if we, uh, if we give the right incentives. Well, we think about where we're at today. You know, Todd, last night, you mentioned uh, you know, the topic of grandchildren. You get, you get a couple of guys like ourselves talking about grandkids. We're going to talk about it all day. But our daughter and, uh, and uh, our son-in-law had their gender reveal party last night. Uh, oh, wow. So, uh, and how, did, how was our family engaged in that moment? Because we have a family that's, we have a daughter, one other daughter in Nashville. I'm in D.C. My wife's back in Montana. Uh, we had we had folks from around the country within the family. How did we do that? It was it was all through FaceTime, right? Wow. And so we all felt like here I had this very uh, you know intimate family time. It was a time of celebration. But we delivered it using using uh, our, our iPhones uh, or our smartphones with FaceTime. And, and similarly, you know we can we can deliver a better experience in healthcare uh, for for our, for the people of this country by incentivizing. It. And, and Todd, to your point. It's not just a rural issue, just as you articulated, uh, trying to get through the congestion of the city, get through with, with mass transit and everything else. By the time you leave, whether you're 40 miles from the hospital outside of Miles City, Montana, or you're two miles from the hospital in downtown Dallas, uh, it might take you about the same amount of time to get to the, uh, the facility. Exactly. Any uh, any observations about the upcoming Olympics? I just want to say another shout out to my my father in law Dave Elmer, who's just an absolute hero of mine. Well, just uh, Todd, thanks for what you are doing to continue to build a um, uh, better understanding of a really complicated issue. Healthcare uh, in in campaigns gets distilled down to a thirty second sound bites, and and you're very thoughtful, and and you're unpacking this in a way that uh, we can understand it better. And but importantly, look for solutions here to drive drive the overall cost down and drive the value equation in, in a better direction for consumers. So uh, my, my hat's tip to you, Todd, and I appreciate joining you to share a few things that's going on here in Capitol Hill. I'm so grateful for your time, Senator. It's great to see you again. Uh, best of luck. And thank you so much for your, for your public service. I know this is not an easy job at any time, and it's especially difficult now. So thank you and thank your family. It's an honor to do it, Todd. Thank you. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Civil Discourse. To learn more about today's topic or our guest, visit www.the60percentsolution.com or www.tfip.group.